Great. Well, we might as well uh, just jump in. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Jordan Beck, and I'm the coordinator with the UHN's Office of Research Trainees. And uh, I'm joined here today by my, my coworker, the ORT manager, Dr. Amanda Vary. So before we jump into uh, today's session, I would just like to do a quick uh, plug and advertisement for a couple of uh, ORT events um, this April. So every every month, uh, the ORT hosts drop-in sessions as a as a way to come and meet with the ORT in person or or on Zoom. And we have we meet at different sites across UHN at Princess Margaret, Kremble, Discovery Tower, at Toronto Recap as well uh, as a virtual session. So if you'd like to stop by and you have any questions for us or just want to chat, um, you can stop by one of our sessions listed on the screen or follow the QR code for the for the schedule there. As well as we do have a pet therapy event taking place on April 17th. This will be in the Toronto General Hospital. So if you'd like to come by and uh, meet some little furry friends, that would be uh, really great as well. So before we begin, I'd also like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So there has been a UHN house hospital on this land since 1829. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional territory for many, for many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. This is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work here. I'd also like to acknowledge that one of our speakers is joining us from uh, Miami, Florida, which is, the, which is home to the past, present, and future generations of the Taino, Tequesta, Seminole tribe of Florida, the Mikosku tribe of Indians of Florida, and all First Nations people. So if you'd like to learn more about the land that you are currently located on, I invite you to scan the QR code on the top and uh, input your location there. As well as if you'd like to learn more about the Indigenous history in Canada, the, the QR code on the bottom will link you to some, some great resources. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, so please do keep your cameras off and muted during the, during the presentation just so we can conserve the, the internet bandwidth. Um, and then if you have any questions, please do pop those into the chat and we'll be able to answer those during the Q&A portion at the, end of the, uh, at the end of all the presentations. And finally, um, this, this is a safe space. So we do ask that all participants follow the ORT code of conduct and non-compliance will result uh, in the removal from today's session. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today. So please join me, join me in welcoming uh, Michael Kurz, the Director of Energy, Environmental Compliance, Energy and Sustainability here at UHN. Uh, Josephine Law, the Sustainability Coordinator with UHN Energy and, in, and Environment. And uh, finally, Cristal Ruiz, the Business Development Manager with uh, My Green Lab. So with that, I'll pass the floor off to uh, Michael and we can get started. Okay, thank you very much. Just putting my screen up here. And Jordan, are you able to confirm that I'm good to go? Yes, I can see it. Awesome. Okay, so thank you uh, to Dr. Berry and the ORT for the opportunity to present on this exciting topic, sustainability in research. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jordan. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the director of UHN's Energy and Environment Department. Um, I've been working at UHN on energy projects for about 10 years, and although there are many uh, aspects of sustainability, so my primary focus for this presentation is going to be on building-related energy consumption and, and emissions associated with that. And I'm also really looking forward to my co-presenters, Josephine and Christelle's discussions on some broader sustainability topics in research. So... Energy sustainability is often thought of in terms of financial costs of utilities. So purchasing electricity, gas, district energy, water, um, and financial sustainability is a key aspect of sustainability. However, the sole focus on reducing costs may not necessarily line up with um, emissions reductions and environmental targets. For example, at UHN, the majority of our utility cost is electricity. However, the majority of our emissions come from uh, natural gas-based heating. And at UHN, we do recognize that climate change is primarily caused by fossil fuel combustion and is putting a strain on healthcare systems worldwide, as is clear from all these quotes that I have up on the slide here. 
um, from various prestigious medical organizations. So what has UHN been doing about our greenhouse gas emissions? Here's a chart going back to 2010, um, which I've just updated. So those 2023 numbers are a bit in a draft state, but I think uh, they're good for now. Um, to try and explain this chart, this is UHN scope one and two emissions, which means scope one is stuff we burn on site, so gas. Uh, scope two is um, uh, utilities where other people are doing the burning stuff for us. For example, if we buy electricity that's produced by burning natural gas or steam that's produced by burning natural gas. Um, the blue line on this chart is our actual emissions associated with our utilities. The red line is what our projected emissions would have been if we continued our baseline as usual. And the shaded green in between is our um, savings that we've achieved. So you can see we're trending downwards over time. Uh, however, it could be faster. And there is an uptick happening in the recent years here. Um, where our electric grid in Ontario has become has uh, been uh, increasing levels of gas uh, gas fired electricity generation, so we have seen some increases as a result of that. Here are uh, some other projects I like to discuss about specifically how UHN's research facilities have contributed to some of these energy and greenhouse gas savings. Um, and in case people aren't familiar, uh, there's some acronyms. PMCRT is the Princess Margaret Cancer Research Tower at the Mars site, and KDT is the Kremble Discovery Tower at the Toronto Western site. So this was one of the first projects I worked on at UHN in 2013, uh, converting the lobby at PMCRT from old school halogen lights to fluorescent, or sorry, not to fluorescent, to LED, um, reducing power consumption by 85% and improving light levels. And that wasn't the only um, LED project we've done. Over the last 10 years or so, we've done an extremely large amount of LED retrofits throughout all the UHN sites, including about uh, 18,000 plus lamps of uh, four foot fluorescence being replaced with LEDs at, uh, at both the research sites. And that, that represents about a million kilowatt hours of savings and um, significant uh, dollar savings as well on, on uh, electricity costs. And whenever we do these projects, we try to improve conditions. So for um, exterior lights, we improve the uh, visibility and safety uh, at nighttime at the same time as saving energy. And I included photos of some of the different types of LED lights we've, we've put in on various projects. One of the biggest emissions reduction projects that we've done uh, at, at UHN and specifically at the research sites is uh, known as demand controlled ventilation. So typical lab facilities are designed for a worst case scenario, really high air changeover, um, as if chemicals are being spilled continuously and need to be flushed out of the building, uh, often up to 12 air changes per hour. Um, and under normal operating uh, conditions, that level of air exchange uh, isn't necessary to maintain comfort and safe, safety. Uh, so at, at the UHN uh, research towers, a system has been put in place to regularly monitor air quality and ramp up air changes as required if contaminants are detected in the air. So it maintains safety while also uh, making better use of, of the HVAC systems from an energy standpoint. So it allows energy efficiency while maintaining safety and comfort. And that has yielded uh, large utility savings, uh, $870,000 per year. And in terms of greenhouse gas, because we're bringing in so much less outside air, we're saving a lot up to 2,700 tons of CO2 per year on our heating costs. And at Energy Environment, we like uh, uh, measuring and verifying savings. This is the electricity consumption of the exhaust fans. Uh, before the retrofit and after, and you can see it's dropped by almost half, and that also reduces um, our air exchanges and heating costs and, and emissions associated with that. Another project 
booster pumps at PMCRT. What's a booster pump? It's something to get water to the higher floors of tall buildings. The old system was oversized. Uh, we put in smaller pumps that are right size for the system. We added uh, variable speed drives to allow the pumps run at partial load when you don't need uh, full flow. And that significantly reduced power consumption. And we were able to do some other um, maintenance uh, features that that helped with that, such as integrating with the building automation system. So the uh, building operators have better visibility on it and improving some pipe insulation as well. Another uh, exciting project that was led by our facilities team was uh, cooling tower water softeners uh, at KDT. A cooling tower is a, a big piece of equipment, typically on a roof, that rejects heat from the air conditioning system. And, but, and it does that by evaporating water. So it uses a lot of water. Um, the water softener essentially removes uh, um, minerals from the water to enable you to recycle it more times and allow the concentration to be higher when you're evaporating it in the cooling tower. So it saved a huge amount of water. Water is expensive, uh, almost $20,000 per year cost savings. Uh, so that was a, a pretty cool project. This one is kind of an unexpected one. It was a, a high performance computing node replacement. Uh, so this is a replacement of an old supercomputer. And uh, apparently older computers are extreme energy gluttons because the new system was about a 10th of the size. It used to be a huge mainframe. Now it's like a filing cabinet and it reduced the electricity consumption by about not, over 90%. Now this is the biggest project that we currently have underway. It's known as the wastewater energy transfer system. This is a huge project at the Toronto Western and KDT sites to utilize a renewable resource that maybe we don't always think of, which is the heat available in the sewers in our city. Um, luckily that site is located to a huge municipal sewer that has continuous flow and temperature year round. So we're able to both take heat out of it and reject heat into it. And this is expected to uh, reduce UHN's overall emissions by 20% and water consumption by 10%. And it's going to be equivalent to 1,800 vehicles off the road. We're expecting to get cooling from the system this summer and heating next winter. So keep an eye out for that one. Projects in development. We're also working with another district energy provider, N-Wave. Um, they currently provide deep lake cooling to a number of our sites. However, when you provide air condition air cooling, that building is rejecting heat. So you have cold water coming in and warm water going out. So we're looking at the idea of using that warm water as a heating resource instead of just sending it back to their cooling plant. So that's the idea behind that one. And another project to enhance heat recovery from MCRT's existing uh, heat recovery systems. Um, and those have some significant greenhouse gas reduction potential. So this kind of takes that previous greenhouse gas scope one and two emissions chart, and it tries to extend it out into the future and apply the results of some of these projects to make sure we're going to reach our 2030 targets. And you can see the wet system has a huge impact in the next couple of years. Um, and this is the other N-Wave heat recovery project. The, the, the little blue slot here is UHN projects underway. And it's so narrow towards the end because we're adding a new patient tower at Toronto Western, which brings it, uh, almost increases our emissions after doing that. So I do, my role at UHN is uh, all about energy and sustainability. So in order to have credibility, I like to try to walk the walk and spread the word um, about decarbonization in my home life too. Uh, and I was really excited to hear <laughs> that uh, Dr. Vary has also put a heat pump on her house since my last time talking about this. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, so how did I decarbonize my house? Um, the first step is reducing the amount of heat you need. So I added attic insulation. I did some uh, caulking and air sealing, um, replaced my gas-fired hot water tank with an electric one, replaced the gas stove with an induction, which had all kinds of other benefits, which I won't go into right now, and then replaced my air conditioner with a heat pump. The total cost wasn't crazy, although this was 
below or before the recent inflation crazes occurred. So it's probably more expensive now. Um, although there were no rebates available at the time. So that could also be a benefit. But I'm able to save about $200 per year on utilities, despite electricity being expensive. These electric systems are so much more efficient that you're using less overall energy to the point that you can save energy even though it's more expensive. Um, one unexpected item was saving $100 per year on insurance, which kind of makes sense because there's no explodable, you know, explosive gas in my house anymore. Um, and then I eliminated four and a half tons per year, um, which seems pretty small compared to what we can do at, at UHN, um, but every little bit counts. Here's just a chart of my ut utility costs at home. And there's four, five years on here now, and basically they'll overlap with each other. The main point is that it costs about the same to heat and cool an electric house as it does one with gas. Uh, so I don't need to talk about that much more than that. To summarize my lessons learned, as I just said, electric costs about the same to operate as gas. Technology is widely available to cut fossil fuels uh, cost effectively. Gas is not clean or efficient because it causes climate change, um, even though it has the word natural in it. The key is to have a plan in place before your appliances fail, because if you're panicking to do it at the last second, you're just going to get whatever's on the shelf. Um, I've been seeing a lot of heat pumps pop up in my neighborhood, so contractors, I think, are more comfortable with it now. So you can do it, too. It's not rocket science. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it in more detail another time. But I'll leave the floor to my colleagues now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, it's my turn now. I'll it share is. my yes. screen. Spot you, Joseph. Oh, no. Jordan, do you mind confirming if you can see yep. my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect. All right. Uh, just to get started, I'll quickly introduce myself. So hi, everyone. My name is Josephine. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator here at UHN. And like Mark, I'm part of the Energy and Environment Department. But my responsibilities involve overseeing a lot of the different sustainability initiatives that you see in research. Uh, so that's one segment I'll be talking about. But first, I'll be sharing some different ways we can be sustainable in our daily lives and at home. So to start things off, I wanna talk about what is sustainability and what this actually means. Uh, so to put it simply, it means meeting our needs today without endangering future generations. And it's really important for us to learn about sustainability just so we have that knowledge and skills to make more sustainable choices in our practice and in our daily life. So hopefully after this webinar, you'll learn different ways to reduce your carbon footprint, lower your energy consumption and be more efficient with your resources. So the first topic I wanna to dive into is how we can have a clean commute. So the key idea here is always trying to stay away from using an electric or a gas powered vehicle, sorry, and switching to better alternatives like an electric vehicle or even better yet having an active commute. So walking or biking are really great options. But of course, this is not the most convenient for everyone. So getting a bus pass or even carpooling. And if you're a frequent biker, I definitely recommend joining the bicycle user group at UHN or Bugs. Uh, they send really great emails and updates with all things bike related. Uh, also check out the Bike Share Toronto staff discount. Uh, by signing up with your organization's email, you can receive a 30 to 45 minute extended uh, bike access. And they also do discounts for electric bikes as well. So you get a 50% discount for this. Uh, if you're more into public transportation like me, I definitely recommend getting a Presto. And if you really have one, look into the different benefits that Presto offers, such as the TTC annual discount. And don't forget, recently in February, they just launched the One Tap Fare. So if you're like me taking different transportation lines like the YRT and TTC, everything is one fare now. So you're not paying twice to subway and bus. And ultimately, this makes things a lot cheaper than paying for parking, uh, especially downtown in Toronto. Uh, something else to consider is carpooling. 
And a great way to get started is with the Smart Commute app. Uh, by downloading this app, they have a feature which matches you with other people that are traveling to a similar or the same destination as you. And if you have an electric vehicle, the great thing about UHN is we have a lot of different charging stations at a lot of our parking lots. So for example, at Toronto General Hospital and Toronto Western Hospital, this is available to not only staff, but to our visitors as well. So since it's free of charge, it's really easy for you to just plug in and go. So now moving on, I have a few water conservation tips for you guys. Uh, the first thing that's really easy to do is upgrade any faucets, shower heads, and toilets you might have to the low flow fixtures. Uh, so with the standard fixtures, they actually consume a significant amount of water per minute. And with the low flow fixtures, it maintains the same amount of pressure. But with the technology they use, um, it's just using less water per minute. So you're not really sacrificing any of the functionality and it's actually an additional benefit, which is the lower cost for your water bills, uh, which is really awesome. Something else to keep in mind is never letting any leaks go unnoticed. <clears throat> so for example, if you see a dripping faucet or a running toilet, uh, always fix them immediately just because they might not seem like a big deal, but over time they can lead to significant water wastage. So fix them promptly and if you're ever on site, give someone from facilities a call. And lastly, always try to implement different sustainable and mindful water use habits into your daily life. So simple stuff like turning off the tap when you're brushing your teeth, uh, taking shorter showers, or even only running a dishwasher or laundry machine once you have a full load. So this way you're making the most out of the cycle. And a lot of these tips can also apply to energy conservation. So like Mike mentioned, trying to switch to LED light bulbs. And another easy thing you can do when you're leaving a room is turning off anything with a plug or switch. So any lights or even your computer monitors. So now moving on to waste reduction, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the three R's, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. There's an additional two R's we like to enforce here. Uh, so one of them is refuse at the top of the triangle. And we also have rot, which is for composting. And we displayed everything here in this upside down triangle and pyramid for a reason. It's just to show which ones are the most effective at waste reduction to the very worst. So of course we wanna start with our avoidance strategies. So refuse, reduce and reuse uh, just to minimize our disposal methods. And in terms of our disposal methods, we always want to start with recycling, and then the next best option is compost, then the garbage, and the absolute worst is biomedical and pharmaceutical waste. And this is just because the disposal methods is incineration or autoclave, which are very energy intensive processes. So we always advise to use these streams as sparingly as possible. All right, so now let's talk about making sustainable consumer choices. Uh, so this is kind of integrating our avoidance strategies we just went over to shop smart and sustainably. Uh, so the first point to consider is always trying to buy quality items that last. Uh, just because in doing so, you're reducing the frequency and the need to replace these items. And ultimately, over time, this cuts down on waste and resources. Uh, next, always try to buy local and seasonal products because you're not only supporting communities this way, but you're also reducing the carbon footprint associated with the transportation for many of these goods. And another important aspect to consider is trying to buy secondhand items because this helps to extend the life cycle of the product, but you're also contributing to circular economy. So again, this idea of reducing and reusing what you can. And also don't forget to donate items back to the cycle to keep it going. And if you're looking for a spot to donate, I recommend doing it at Value Village. It's not only the most accessible, but they often give you a 20% off coupon when you donate for your next purchase. So there's money savings involved for you guys as well. And the last tip is when you're making a purchasing decision, always try to opt for products and even services that have a lower environmental impact. 
So this can include choosing energy efficient options, products with fewer or no toxic materials, those with minimal packaging waste or are even recyclable. And I also listed a few examples of third party eco certified stickers to look for on your products. Uh, so like what Mike was talking about with your appliances, you can check out the Energy Star logo on it. And that's just a good confirmation that it has a lower environmental impact this way. So now moving on, my last tip in terms of how we can be sustainable at home is related to biodiversity. So one really easy thing we can do is trying to green up our workspace, our offices, or even our kitchens with plants. And if you're not much of a planter or haven't been too successful in the past, I recommend starting with a monstera plant, a peace lily, or even a snake plant. And if you had to choose one from experience, I recommend the monstera. I actually have one in my basement and it gets very minimal lighting but it's still green flourishing and thriving so definitely go for the monstera uh, other stuff you can do is support local wildlife so having a bird feeder in your garden or even on your balcony or porch uh, including native plants in your garden as well and always trying to avoid any pesticides and chemical fertilizers um, some other great alternatives is if you're a coffee lover putting your coffee grounds into your garden instead or even your tea bags or any other organic waste you're producing and aside from gardening at home uh, try to participate in community gardening events. So I know at my community center, they offer a lot of different stuff in the spring and summer. But if this is hard for you to find, UHN, the energy and environment team, we host a lot of different planting events. Uh, so the most upcoming event is Nature Stewarding for Earth Month. And we also have a lot of different tree planting events on the way. So if you're interested, you can always email green at uhn.ca for this. So now moving on to part two, this focuses on sustainability specifically in research. Uh, this is a really important topic here because laboratories are actually very energy intensive spaces and they're very big resource and water consumers. Uh, so hopefully in the next few slides by sharing some of the different initiatives we have in place, you guys can get involved or maybe be empowered to fine tune your methods in other ways as well. So one very big program we have is the Shut the Sash and Door program. Um, this is run at PMCRT and KDT at UHN. And how it works is most fume hoods, you might notice that there's this sticker here. It has a color gradient, so going from red to green. Uh, ideally, once you're done using your fume hood, you want to keep your sash closed within the green area. Uh, ideally, fully closed is best, but if not, in the green area. And this is just because when fume hoods are left open past this point, they're very energy intensive. They pull in a lot of air, and they can use the same amount of energy as 3.5 homes. So by closing your fume hood sashes, you can help save 60% of this energy, or around two homes worth of energy. And the door component for this program is also very important because we want to maintain the airflow pressure within the laboratory spaces. So now moving on, another initiative we have in research is the swap shelf. And how this works is if your laboratory has any unused or surplus equipment that's still in good condition and not expired, uh, instead of throwing it out, you can divert this waste from the landfill by bringing it to the swap shelf on the fifth floor of PMCRT or on the ninth floor of PMH, so Princess Margaret Hospital. And this way, other laboratories can use it instead. So this is one way you guys can reuse in a lab space. But of course, like I mentioned before, uh, refusing and reducing are the best options and what you want to start with. Uh, so this is why we always recommend reevaluating your inventory, just so you can identify uh, what items you're getting a surplus of and that are getting wasted. And we have this big emphasis here on wasted supplies. So minimizing that because wasted supplies can actually lead to triple the waste. Because first we're paying to dispose of these items, then we're paying to order it again. And then there's this issue of supply chain reliance. 
So another wonderful initiative we've undertaken is diverting ice packs from ending up in the landfill. Uh, in general, in a laboratory setting, we receive a large quantity of ice packs uh, just to preserve the integrity of various materials during transportation, uh, just so when they reach us, it's still in optimal condition. Uh, but what was really disheartening about the situation was seeing that a lot of the ice packs that were still perfectly usable were being discarded after this one use. Uh, so over the years, what we implemented was uh, the solution where we send the ice packs back to various communities and organizations uh, for reuse. And in 2023, we sent 1,630 pounds uh, worth of ice packs back to various organizations with Frogo Bio being our biggest recipient. So if you're at PMCRT or KDT, um, the easiest way you can participate is by looking out for these collection bins. They're normally found uh, in front of the freezer corridors or right when you enter a laboratory space. And if not, you can always contact green at uhn.ca to get this re uh, arranged. So the last initiative I want to talk about is the visual waste audit. So this is a random inspection I do on a weekly or bi-weekly basis where I'm just checking the compliance of your bins. So how well you guys are sorting your bins. And we normally post this information on the TV displays on a monthly basis, but this is something you guys can easily do as well. So whenever you're going to the bins to throw something out, have a look at all the different streams just to see how well your colleagues are sorting and your floor in general. And if you notice any reoccurring problems, you can always let us know, again, at green at uhn.ca. And we can either put up posters if they're missing for sorting signages. And something else we offer is waste refreshers, where I'm not only going over how to sort general waste, so like our garbage, our recycling, and our compost, but I also dive into our hazardous waste as well. So our biomedical waste, our cytotoxics, and pharmaceutical waste. So if this is something your lab might be interested in, uh, feel free free to contact me personally or again, green at uhn.ca. And the last thing I want to leave it off with, uh, something really easy you can do is joining the green team. There's over 700 UHN staff all across our site, part of the green team, and research makes up around or over 100 of green team members. And it's just a great way to promote environmental sustainability in a fun way for everyone. And it's also a great way to meet colleagues that have a similar interest to you. And you're also the first to hear about green events. So this is a great time to join since it's Earth Month. We're gonna be sending out a lot of emails with different opportunities and events that you can join. And we also send out monthly newsletters with updates for all our different initiatives. So if you're curious in terms of the compliance monthly for Shut the how much we're donating for ice packs. Uh, this is the best way to be informed aside from the TV displays. So thank you everyone. This concludes my segment of the webinar. I just want to remind you guys, we're always here to support you um, and answer any questions you might have. Uh, direct them always to green at uhn.ca and a great resource for you guys is our department blog as well. So talking trash with uhn.ca.com. And I'll pass it over to Crystal now. Thanks, Josephine. All right, let me pull up my screen. It's great to see a lot of the initiatives that you've already been working on. And um, I'm gonna piggy a little bit back off of Josephine and talk a little bit more about um, a focus on sustainability in your research labs. So hopefully you guys can see my slides all right, but just wanted to talk um, about my green labs. So some of you might be familiar, this might be a new topic for you, but my Green Lab, we are a global nonprofit that's been around for over a decade with a mission of building a global culture of sustainability and science. It actually first started off really as a grassroots effort from a neuroscientist who was working in the lab herself and just extremely fed up with all of that plastic waste and the energy, water, which I'm sure sounds very familiar. So my Green Lab was for her lab, but it really has scaled into a global movement. And we're working across more than 50 different countries with thousands of different labs through our programs. So we have, of course, that mission of building a culture of sustainability in your lab space. So that starts off by really first bringing awareness to the impacts in your lab. Then we're able to share all of the best practices, case studies, uh, resources, and tools 
so that you can really change how you're using your lab space without jeopardizing the important work that you're doing, of course. And our vision here is to ensure a world where all science is conducted in this way, where we're benefiting the health and well-being of people in our planet. So how do you really get started with this? It's really because labs are just such resource intensive spaces that we're really trying to focus in on how can we reduce that energy, water and waste. You can see they use 10 times more energy, four times more water than an office space equivalent and about 5.4 billion kilograms of plastic waste each and every year. So that's about 2% of global production of plastic waste is being used from our labs. So at My Green Lab, we have this entire program ecosystem to really support you on your sustainability journey. I think a lot of it is really core focused on education to get started. We also offer two different certification programs for labs, but also for lab manufacturers. And then we have some global campaigns to help drive some bigger sector changes. So I just wanted to quickly touch on each of these um, to give you an idea of what you could be doing um, to learn more. The first program is the My Green Lab Ambassador Program. This is a free on-demand program we have right on our website at mygreenlab.org. So everybody on this call is more than welcome to join. You don't even need to be necessarily working in the lab space to participate. It essentially goes through a um, four quirky videos on these topics here. You answer some questions, but what's really neat about it is you're invited to a global network of ambassadors worldwide. And we have a Teams channel, so you could ask questions, share tips. We also host monthly webinars. So it's just a great way to really join the Green Labs community, um, you know, outside of your organization as well. But if you wanted to get a deeper dive into specific topics, maybe you're focusing on green chemistry or maybe you're in charge of procurement, we do also offer accredited professionals program course. So this is one of our newer programs that we officially launched last year, where we have six topics that go into great detail. So each module probably takes around maybe an hour to three hours to complete. If you complete all six, you'll become an accredited professional um, and you'll get a certification of your achievement as well. And then the next program that's really focused on education is our International Freezer Challenge. So this is a friendly competition that we host every single year that's really just focused on how we can improve those cold storage. So your negative 80 freezers, negative 20 refrigerators, anything um, that's in that space, we give you essentially a scorecard of different initiatives that you can work on. This could be things like cleaning out old samples, having an inventory, even moving negative 80 freezers to negative 70 helps save about 30% of energy. And we have a lot of resources on our freezerchallenge.org website that really showcases how this is a um, supported initiative. And of course, it's up to you to decide what you would want to implement for your freezers. As you check it off, we have prizes and winners when we wrap up the program on July 1st. Um, you could also even host an internal competition if you'd like. So if you're interested in being able to compare different lab groups and seeing how they improve, you could also sign up as a site coordinator and then get access to your internal scorecards. And then, of course, people are always incentivized with a pizza party or some sort of fun initiative to, to get engagement going as well. The next program I wanted to touch on is actually something where we work really closely with lab manufacturers on their products. So of course we can't have a green lab without green products. So my green lab has started the ACT label program. This is something that uh, really focuses on going through third-party audits of manufacturers products. It could be a chemical, it could be a consumable, even equipment. They are all scaled um, similarly, because as you can see, X stands for accountability, consistency, and then transparency, of course, from the manufacturer to the user. So how it works is a, let's say a manufacturer wants to have their, um, let's say pipette tip certified through the ACT program. They go through a third party audit, and then we essentially are taking similarly like an LCA of their product, but trying to make it very easy to understand for the end user. Um, very clear. 
So once we have that third party audit done, then we scale it from one to 10 with 10 being the highest impact in these different categories. So for the lab user who's looking to buy that pipette tip, they can go right onto our public database, type in pipette tip and get to see which uh, product has that lowest environmental footprint here in North America, or maybe even in Europe. Um, there's three different labels depending on your region. And uh, you can see right here the uh, environmental impact factors. So the lower the number, the lower the impact. There's also a lot more details on the website, so you can kind of get more insight into how was the material uh, sourced, if there's renewable energy, things like that. So it's really broken down further if you wanted to get more details as well. So the last program I wanted to spend a little more time on is really our flagship program here at My Green Lab. It's essentially the My Green Lab certification program that's really focused on how do we change behaviors in the lab space to be uh, greener. And what we found is being able to do an online assessment from your lab group that covers these 14 different topics here. It's typically about 150 questions, but it's very straightforward. So it takes around 30 to 45 minutes to complete the questionnaire. And the entire process to get the certification usually takes around eight to 10 months. So I wanted to give you a little more insight into what that looks like. So let's say you wanted to get started on the certification program. We would start off by really just assessing the baseline. There's not too much prep that goes into this. We would send out the link to your lab members. Everybody has a unique link that they have three weeks to complete. So it is something that they could start, come back to if they need. We ask that at least 50% of the lab is participating because we really do want this to be a program that's changing the culture. We don't want it to fall into just one or two people making all these changes. So once we have 50% or more participation, our program team of experts, they'll take about two weeks to really analyze the results of the assessment. And then they're sending you a detailed tailored feedback report for your lab. So step two is really just about going through this feedback report, typically about 60 plus pages of information that's gonna give you insight into your staff engagement. So you can see if there's any kind of miscommunications or easy wins. You also get the uh, chapters on each topic. So this will be more resources, statistics, so you can explain why it's important. And then of course, different recommendations that uh, you're able to pick and choose what you wanna implement. It's really great having that green team because they can really help drive some of those changes, that momentum. Um, and really what some organizations might do is focus on one topic per month, or they might split up the work in the lab. It's really flexible depending on how much, um, how much resource you have in your lab space, of course. But usually after six to eight months, labs are ready to come back to take the certification assessment. So. Step three looks very similar to that first step. You're just retaking your assessment with 50% participation within the three weeks. And then this time you get your certification score. It's gonna give you a score based off of all of your initiatives. So of course um, at UHN, you've already been working on some really great initiatives. So that's reflective in both your baseline and your certification. And your certification will be valid for two years. And then every two years, you have the opportunity to come back, improve your score. You might have some turnover, or maybe you're growing into a new lab space. So this is just a great way to encourage continuous improvement. And you can see that here through our, our different levels, with green being the highest. An exciting note to mention was that the United Nations Race to Zero campaign actually chose the My Green Lab certification as a 2030 breakthrough outcome target so for a little context, the UN Race to Zeros is a global campaign to have all of the different economic sectors be net carbon zero by 2050. So they set out 2030 breakthrough outcome targets to really ensure they're on track for that 2050 goal. And for the pharma industry, their 2030 breakthrough outcome target is to have 95% of all major pharma and med tech companies be My Green Lab certified at our highest level by 2030. So this program's already being utilized across all of the top pharmaceutical companies, but it's really just not a program for pharma, but the entire scientific community as we work really closely with academics, um, government agencies, of course, hospitals, even companies like Pepsi 
So it's a very universal tool that works for all different types of labs. This next slide is just giving you an idea of where we're scattered, um, our green labs across the map as well. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the benefits of the program. Of course, cost is a big concern for a lot of organizations. So I wanted to quickly touch on um, a few case studies. This is an example from AstraZeneca where they piloted the program at a, at a multiple labs across um, the site and they were measuring the energy of these labs before starting the program in 2021. And they found that within that year, they were saving over $300,000 in their energy costs from um, the labs that participated. So that was also equivalent to about 900 tons of carbon emissions that were reduced in that energy cost. And then, of course, they saw a great return, which was 4.3x um, on that first investment to join the program. I wanted to also talk about some of the impact you can see from just one single lab participating. And this is a great example from the Technical University of Berlin, where they piloted the program at their biochemistry lab in uh, Berlin. And they found that they were saving on about 35% of the lab's original energy use. And that, was, uh, um, that helped them achieve a 13x return on that investment. They've also implemented a equipment inventory program, which I'm sure had additional savings um, that we're not able to necessarily calculate, but it's a great thing such as that shelf swap um, that you're also doing at UHN, but also with your equipment. And then the last case study I'll touch on is from the University of Alabama, Burlingham. So they have the largest campus-wide uh, migraine lab certification program. I think they're close to now 200 labs um, that participate uh, in the certification, but they're also huge participants in our freezer challenge as well. So you can see that they're typically saving enough energy from their freezer maintenance to power 75 US homes worth of energy. So definitely feel free to, to check out the freezer challenge program because it's running until July. So you have plenty of time to, to participate. But not only that, they're also seeing great energy reduction in each lab that participates, typically about $4,000 per lab that joins the program, they're see seeing energy uh, savings. And just to touch on some of their waste reductions, they've recycled about 20,000 pounds of pipette tip packaging and reduced waste by 75,000 uh, pounds as well in total. So really just want to recap um, the benefits of, of all of our programs here at My Green Lab is really trying to build a culture of sustainability in the lab space. And this starts by really increasing the collaboration in your lab, but across different departments as you're getting facilities involved, your procurement involved, it explores new ideas and methods, provides healthier materials for the employees, of course, can save a lot of money and resource for the organization. And it's a model uh, for other labs, and it's a publicly recognized certification by the United Nations Race to Zero campaign as well. So just going to end with a big thanks to our sponsors, because again, as a nonprofit, they're very um, helpful in us achieving our mission of having a global culture of sustainability and science. And I encourage you to join our movement. Feel free to check out our newsletter and, of course, like I mentioned, our free programs. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing, and we can open it up to any questions. So yeah, just like Crystal said, um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself, turn on your video, now's a, a perfect time to do that. Um, yeah. There's also some really great uh, links and, and comments placed into the chat. So please have a look at those. Um, so many great uh, resources and, and links to, to, to check out, so. <clears throat> Yeah, Same Amanda, thing. I'm just seeing your comment here about the ACT initiative agreed. It's it's very common to see a lot of um, companies saying they have a green product and things like that. And just want to really reiterate that the ACT label doesn't necessarily mean it's a quote unquote green product, but we're really just trying to have that transparency so the consumer themselves can actually compare what product has the lowest environmental footprint across these different um, topics. So excellent point of, of bringing that up. Maybe if nobody has any questions just yet, maybe I, I could ask the first one. Um, maybe this is a big question, but if you, anyone can 
pick or pinpoint for somebody who's interested in kind of starting on their sustainability journey? Is there something that you think would be the best first thing to pick or an easy first thing to choose either in your daily life or at research to start getting on a sustainability um, or incorporating sustainability into their lifestyle? Um, I could answer that. Um, in a way, it's a big question, but in a way, it's a small question. Um, the, the real answer is anything that interests you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in sustainability, there's uh, there's numerous topics, uh, as you've heard from you know all three of us today. Um, you can have a big impact at UHN in the lab. You can have an impact at home or in your community. Um, and right now, actually, is Earth Month at UHN, so you can follow... Um, you can go go on there and there's a lot of webinars and activities that you can look at and see what you're interested in. There's a nature stewarding activity. There's lots of different webinars out there. So I'd encourage you, the first step is to do something. It could be anything. Yeah, and uh, just to build on what Mike was saying, just starting small, finding a few things that actually interest you that you're able to maintain and do consistently. And yeah, Earth Month is a great time to start. And if you ever need any support, uh, that's what our department is here to help you guys with. So you can always reach out to anyone on our team. And we're happy to have a one on one chat with you or even joining the green team is a great place to start. Uh, just because we send a lot of helpful emails and updates um, with different ideas that might empower and inspire you as well. Absolutely. I love the idea of starting with what interests you because there is sustainability really across the board. I mean, there's so many different avenues that you can go through. And, you know, just to build on that too, it's it's really also just starting with education. I think a lot of people aren't really aware of, of the impacts of certain um, actions and things that are just really custom in our society. So kind of just bringing that awareness through education and learning more on what interests you is is the best place to start. Yeah, that's all really great suggestions. Thank you. And I think once you start talking about it, you'll find that there's lots of people that are interested in this and are willing to help push it forward. Absolutely. I remember when I was work started working in the lab, I really couldn't believe the amount of plastic waste that there was. It was it was quite shocking. So it's I think this, I think that's these are all really great places to places to start. Um. There are some questions now coming in through the chat. Um, I'll just kind of, I'll just maybe go down the list. Um, so the first one is from uh, Anand. So is there is there a place where I can find any energy rebates in slash incentive programs that can you can be utilized at UHN research facility lab equipment? For example, having freezers from the 80s and 90s work, but they're obviously not as efficient in energy usage by today's standard. So any uh, rebates or incentive programs at UHN? Um, I believe the um, IESO, the Independent Electric System Operator in Ontario, um, does have incentives available for uh, electricity conservation measures. Um, so if you have any particular projects in mind, feel free to reach out to us and we can figure out if we can get a check for you for it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Tess. Um, would this would the sustainability green lab be mandated? Could the I guess could the sustainability green lab be mandatory across UHN? Is there a is there a specific target timeline? Is there a fee for green lab certification? Uh, yeah, I guess I can answer that. Um, in yeah. terms of mandatory, I'm not too sure about that, but I think ideally we're currently in the process of just getting the buzzword around. So inviting Christelle from My Green Labs to introduce this to UHN. And then ideally we would like at least majority of labs taking part of this. And in terms of a target timeline, I think it's just getting that word across before we actually implement it in place. And Absolutely. the fee... Um, yeah, sure I, I can go ahead and speak on that, Josephine. So yes, we um, we have a small fee that typically um, is really subsidized through our sponsorships. So for universities, hospitals, and government academics, um, it's a couple hundred dollars per lab to participate. It includes your entire certification journey and the, your certificate for the two years. Um, typically, I would say a lot of organizations are interested in piloting the program first, so that might be a good next step is trying to find some labs that are interested in participating in the certification program, seeing how it works for them. 
Um, and then you can kind of from there talk about maybe like a target timeline or um, if it's something that you want to scale out further. But happy to chat more about that if you're interested. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is from uh, Lely. Um, so how the question is, how do you get people who might have never have heard of a sustainability in research to get, and how do you get them motivated or interested in participating in these initiatives? Do you have any recommendations for sparking, I guess, interest in new sustainability initiatives? Yes, I, I, I can answer this quickly too. Um, this is definitely something that is a hurdle for a lot of organizations when they're starting sustainability. And I think it really just starts with finding what interests them. I mean, kind of going back to what Mike was saying, it's it's you really want to find something that they're interested in. If if they're interested in cost savings, you can talk about the benefits of that. If they're interested in having more of an efficient process, you could talk about how there's some initiatives for that. Um, and then, of course, if they're interested in, you know, just reducing their footprint, maybe for their children or their hobbies or um, any kind of connection you can build on what they might be interested, I think, is um, kind of that middle ground to generate interest. And starting small, I mean, there's definitely some easy wins um, that we've definitely talked about here today that I think could be scaled out, um, hopefully, uh, with some, yeah, some interest. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to build on that too. Um, the comment has a, an idea of awareness of the issues in it. And if it's a matter of training or having someone come to talk about it, Josephine is a super trainer. Uh, and uh, some of uh, the people on our team are super trainers and we're always happy to come and raise the issues and talk about the potential impact because people might not understand that um, some of these initiatives do have a big impact on the organization. Yeah, and just to add on to what Mike was saying, I mentioned in my presentation doing waste refreshers, but some other stuff I do for labs is just coming at the beginning of their lab meeting for five minutes and just quickly going over how a lot of our different initiative works and just addressing any questions in terms of um, participation and getting involved. Um, so yeah, always reach out to anyone on our team. That's great, thank you. Um, just I also just want to highlight a couple other comments that were placed into the chat. Um, Lisa placed a uh, a notice about um, nature stewarding. So there's uh, an event happening on April thirteenth. There's a link in the in the chat as well. And then uh, Amanda uh, sent a link about a blog post about um, ways to reduce your footprint in in the areas of AI and machine learning research. So two really great things to to check out as well. We so I guess we're looking at uh, two minutes. To, Two minutes to 3.30 now, so if there's any uh, last minute questions, um, now's the time, unless we can give everybody an extra two minutes back to their day. Perfect, okay, so I guess thanks, um, thanks very with much, that, everybody. Thank, thank you so Jordan. much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care, have a happy Earth Month. <laughs> yes, happy Earth Month. Bye.